Hi all, welcome back. Thank you for uh, joining us here today. Uh, Jake here from the Australian Reptile Park and today we are talking keeping reptiles as pets. Now to some, keeping a reptile, a snake or a lizard or even a turtle like behind me here, in your living room or your bedroom might sound very bizarre um, and quite foreign, but there is literally thousands, potentially millions of people right across the world which keep reptiles in their own home. And that is what we're gonna be talking to you a little bit about this afternoon. Now, I'm gonna to get to some reptiles, some popular reptiles that you're able to keep here in Australia. But before we do, uh, let's talk about the processes, what you may go through if you're looking at getting a reptile. Now, the first thing you want to do if you are thinking about getting a reptile, you want to potentially keep one as a pet, is do your research. Here in Australia, we are extremely fortunate. We have over a thousand species of reptile and quite a number of those you're able to keep in a captive environment, in your home potentially. But in saying that, they're all individual, they all have their own individual requirements and their needs are a little bit different as well. So the best thing you can do to start out with is do your research. If you only got room for say a one or two foot tank in the corner of your bedroom, then it's probably not wise to get something like an olive python which might get over three or four meters in length. So you wanna make sure that you are getting the right species for the setup or the requirements that you can meet in your own home. Now, uh, the first thing you want to do once you've decided which reptile you might want to get it, uh, look at buying is get a reptile keeping license. That is a very important thing to do and the licensing requirements or the license that you may need might be a little bit different depending on which state you live in in Australia. Now, here in New South Wales, it's quite simple and for any of the states really, if you want to find uh, the requirements of the license or how to get the license, you very simply would go online and uh, if you just look up for example, reptile keeping license, New South Wales, then everything will pop up uh, that you need to go through the process of acquiring that license. You pay your fee, you get a license number, which is uh, individual to you, very much like a driver's license. And then once you have that, you can then go on and purchase your reptile. Now purchasing a reptile is a very exciting thing, particularly if you've never done it before, but you have to be very wise about it. You have to make sure that you are buying your reptile from what we call a reputable breeder. You want your reptile to be what we call captive bred, which means it's born in captivity. Unfortunately, reptile poaching, it does exist. Uh, people, very sad, they take reptiles from the wild to potentially be sold or traded on. And uh, you certainly don't want to be endorsing that in any way. You want to be making sure the, rep the reptile you're buying is a captive bred and born in captive captivity animals. So um, you want to find a breeder that breeds your species that you're after, and then you can go ahead and purchase it from them. Now, before you do that, it's ideal to have an enclosure or a setup ready to go for your reptile when you bring it home. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here. Now, most reptiles, um, particularly the ones that we keep commonly in captivity, they stay reasonably small. For example, an adult central bearded dragon, it's going to get to about maybe 30 or 40 centimetres in length. You can keep a wide variety of geckos that don't get much longer than 10 or 12 centimetres. So the setup that you're keeping your reptile in does not have to be huge, but in saying that, it's best to always provide your reptile with as much space as you can possibly provide. If you can keep a bearded dragon in an eight foot long enclosure, uh, longer than me, then perfect. You can do that certainly, um, but you don't have to. Uh, a lot of reptiles will be able to uh, thrive in quite a small setup such as this that I've got in front of me here. Now the enclosures vary a little bit. Um, the most common type that we see are these wooden uh, melamine enclosures. They're typically white in colour and a lot of them have these sliding glass doors at the front. It's a really easy way to see your reptile when it's perhaps in your bedroom. You can look at it, see what it's up to without disturbing it too much. But it's also a very effective way of accessing it. You've got that front access, you're not having to worry about um, getting into the enclosure or the tank from above. It makes it a little easier. Now we also have these uh, glass, solid glass enclosures. And you can see this one here, uh, kind of opens up at the front here. It's got these hinging doors as opposed to the sliding doors that we saw there. Again, very simple, very easy access. And the reason that you may want to use a glass enclosure like this is if perhaps you're keeping a species that requires a little bit more humidity. Perhaps they require a little more water in their environment. As we all know, water and wood, they don't mix. So um, if you've got a perhaps 
frog or something like a Boyd's forest dragon where you may be spraying some water in the enclosure, that's one of their requirements, um, then you may want to go with one of these solid glass enclosures as opposed to a wooden type. But for the most part, most pythons, bearded dragons, blue tongue lizards can all very easily be kept in this kind of setup. Now one thing that's very, very important for a reptile is heating. Um, a lot of people will refer to reptiles as cold-blooded, or well, the proper term for that is ectothermic, which means they can't regulate their own internal body temperature like we can. So what you have to do in a captive environment is provide that reptile with some way to uh, warm itself up, raise its core body temperature. And the way that we typically do that is, uh, well, we can do it two ways. We've got a heat lamp here, which you can pop on top of the enclosure, or oh, there's also a very um, wide variety of heat mats available which simply slide underneath the enclosure and provide heat from below. Now really this heat from above is a more natural way of heating your reptile because most reptiles out in the wild are of course warming themselves up via the sun. They're going out, they're basking in the sun and they're warming themselves. So by applying a warm heat glow uh, from above you are basically creating or replicating uh, that sun. But all you're providing really is heat. You also need to provide something that the sun does, which is uh, UVB. Now, uh, this is where UVB lights like this can come in. We've got this linear UVB tube, and uh, these are very important for your reptile, particularly things like your bearded dragon or any of your dragon species, um, because Basically, in the wild, those reptiles, they're basking in the sun, they're exposed to high levels of UVB from the sun. And they actually require that UVB in order to synthesize vitamin D3, which can, uh, is basically very beneficial in calcium absorption. So if you do not provide one of these lights, um, you can very easily run into issues with what we call metabolic bone disease, which is something you want to avoid altogether. It's a really bad thing, so by providing UVB, for your particularly dragon lizards and some of your skinks, um, you are basically providing them with everything they need um, as far as the lighting goes, and they're gonna live a really happy, healthy life. Granted, you've got the rest of the setup um, set up well. You also wanna include what we call a substrate, which can be as simple as some newspaper or butcher's paper like we have here on the bottom of the enclosure, or you can get as fancy as providing some organic soil with live plants in there. You can go as simple or as fancy as you want to. And then you would also want to include some cage furnishings, which typically involved, uh, involve a variety of logs or rocks, something that that reptile can use. Perhaps if it's shedding its skin, it can rub up against there, makes the process a little easier. But lizards, of course, and many snakes will get up onto something to get themselves closer to the heat source. So they like to have something to sit up on and bask. Now I think that's just about covered most of the enclosures. We could go all day and talk about this, but um, you know, for now, that's the basics. Um, you wanna make sure your heating, your lighting is right. You wanna have a substrate at the bottom, your cage furnishings, and of course, you wanna be feeding your reptile the correct thing as well. Diet is a very important thing, uh, but we might not touch on that in this, uh, this show today. We'll, um, we'll touch on that maybe later on because that's a huge topic, diet of reptiles. Now, what we've got here is a very popular pet reptile here in Australia. This is the common or eastern blue tongue skink. Uh, this is a reasonably large one. This is about as large as they get. And this species is found right along the east coast of Australia. Now, there's other species of blue tongue that are found across the rest of Australia. Um, but this one here, the eastern blue tongue, tends to be the most commonly kept. And there's very good reason for that. They're a very, very hardy lizard. They do very well in captivity. Um, they're very voracious when it comes to food. Um, they'll eat a wide variety of things from uh, fruit and veg through to uh, various meats, um, as well as invertebrates, see insects. Um, they'll eat just about anything you put in front of them. And they can also deal with a very wide variety of temperatures. So this species here, it's really a cooler climate species. You find them a lot in the southern parts of the country as well as up into, into Queensland. But um, what that means is they can deal with a wide range of temperatures. They'll come out, they'll bask in the sun. But perhaps if you're going through winter, perhaps you're even keeping your blue tongue outdoors, they can deal with these temperatures that we get during winter, sometimes down into the single digits. They are a very, very hardy reptile and a very popular one. Now, next, we've got not only a popular 
lizard here in Australia, but potentially the world's most popular pet lizard, and that is the bearded dragon. Um, they're a very famous lizard. There's not many people that wouldn't know what a bearded dragon is. And in fact, most people would know someone that keeps a bearded dragon. They are extremely common in captivity. They're very readily bred, and they are a fantastic first lizard. Um, with these, there is a few simple things, as I mentioned before, that you need to keep in mind. This is an arid species. They occur out in the interior of Australia. Um, so like I spoke about, they're exposed to very uh, high levels of UVB and high temperatures. So you have to make sure that you are meeting their needs in the captive environment. That goes back to doing your research. If you do some research, if you look at some habitat photos of where central bearded dragons come from, then you can quite easily match that environment and the temperatures that they're experiencing in your captive environment. Now you can see they're very alert, they're very active, and uh, they're just a beautiful lizard. Again, like our blue tongue, they'll feed on both greens as well as invertebrates. They love crickets, roaches, um, all manner of worms. And uh, it's important when you're keeping any reptile in captivity to pr provide it with as much of a varied diet as you possibly can. The more variation you have, uh, the healthier and better that reptile is going to do. A beautiful little lizard and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, one that is very commonly kept right throughout the world, particularly in the US, believe it or not. Um, despite being an Australian species, this is probably the most popular pet lizard, if not one of the, the most popular pets in the United States and Europe, and of course here in Australia as well. Beautiful lizard, very readily available, and uh, not too expensive either. Very easy one to get your hands on when you put the correct licensing. Now we're gonna move on to a snake. Now snakes, again, are a species that right around the world are very commonly kept. And uh, this one here is probably the more, uh, most popular pet snake here in Australia. This is known as the Stimson's Python. And there's a very good reason that they are one of the most popular pet snakes. And that is because this is full grown. They only stay reasonably small. And uh, again, they're very hardy. They're very easy to care for. And they just are a fantastic pet snake. Very beautiful as well. Um, the whole group really of the, uh, or the, we call it the Antaresia or the children's python group, uh, they all stay reasonably small, they're all reasonably easy to care for and uh, yeah, they just make a fantastic snake to keep at home. One thing you do have to keep in mind with snakes is that they are feeding on rodents, uh, primarily rats and mice. So um, they're very easily, easy to acquire. You can buy uh, those captive bred rodents um, through any of your pet shops as well as um, you know, specialist breeders, but um, yeah, you do have to keep that in mind if you are feeding, uh, sorry, if you're keeping a snake, you're not gonna be feeding it salad like you might a bearded dragon. Uh, you're gonna primarily be feeding it rats and mice. But the beauty of that is they don't need to feed frequently at all. A snake this size would maybe feed once every fortnight or so during summer, and then even less than that during winter. Where these come from, it does get very cool over winter, and you almost want to replicate that in captivity. You would cool them down slightly, you don't have to use as much heat, and you can cut right back on their feeding as well. Now I'm going to pop this guy back in. Of course, pipers come in all uh, shapes and sizes. Um, here in Australia, we've got some very, very large species, olive pythons. Um, any of your carpet python group and certainly scrub pythons, they can get very, very large. So you can certainly keep those species, but you just have to make sure that you are adequate, adequately set up to be able to house that species, because um, they do get very, very large. And you wanna make sure you're increasing your environment or your enclosure um, as that species grows. Now what we've got in here uh, is a couple of turtles. Uh, this is a Manning River turtle, and then we've also got some Cairns long necked turtles. Beautiful animals, always ready for food as you can see. And again, another very common pet reptile. Uh, this is very closely related to your eastern long-necked turtle, these, this species here. Um, and the eastern long neck is probably the most common species which we keep here in Australia. Now, of course, they're a little bit different to keeping a lizard or a snake. Um, turtles, of course, live in water. They spend most of their life in the water. And that is something that you have to take into consideration. As opposed to setting up an enclosure, um, which might have a small water bowl, now you've got 
um, an enclosure which is primarily filled with water and it's more of an aquarium setup. This is how you keep turtles and it brings in a whole new, uh, I guess, level of experience. If you're used to keeping lizards and snakes, going to keeping turtles and worrying about things like water quality and uh, them being able to get out of the water, it can be a little bit different. So they're all considerations that you have to take into account, but with a few very simple things, uh, you can get your turtle set up just right and uh, they thrive in captivity. They love food probably more than any reptile I've ever worked with. Um, they're always ready, they're voracious eaters, and uh, they make really, really good captives. Again, we have some turtles that get very, very large. So if you were keeping, say, a pig-nosed turtle, um, then you would want to make sure that you're set up for that species. You might want to keep them in a 2,000, 3, or 4, even 5,000 litre tank uh, like we do our pig-nosed turtle here at the park. So you just have to be set up for the species that you're getting and uh, take into consideration how large they are going to get. In fact, very, very soon, we're gonna separate out all these turtles and uh, that way they'll have a little more room and uh, they're not getting in each other's way. Now we've got some filtration, of course, on these tanks. You wanna make sure that the water is nice and clean. So what we have down here in the corner, um, we have a small valve where the water gets drawn in. It then goes through a canister filter um, it goes through the back of the uh, tank here through some what we call filtration media and then it enters the tank again over here. Beautiful, nice, clean water and that way the water quality is perfect and uh, your turtle will do very, very well. That's so do you need to have that land space for turtles or do they always live in the water? Um, it is important for them to be able to get out of the water and dry out their shells. They are going to spend most of their time uh, down in the water, but um, you may have seen turtles basking before. They do bask on the land for short periods, and it is important to, one, provide a heat source uh, for them to, to bask under, but also really important with turtles is that UVB light that I spoke about. Without that, um, what turtles can sometimes get is a very soft, rubbery shell, which is not what you want at all. Um, so very important with turtles um, and all reptiles really just because snakes uh, you'll hear they don't need it doesn't necessarily mean you don't provide it um, many snakes will benefit from a uvb light they bask in the sun in the wild so we should uh, be providing it in captivity if we're able to can you get the blue tongue out again it was yeah. really cute before <laughs> Reptiles from overseas as pets? Uh, you cannot. Here in Australia, um, we're not permitted to keep exotic or reptiles from overseas. Um, we're only allowed to keep native species. So, um, a bit unfortunate. There's a lot of species overseas that um, would be fantastic to keep. Um, but in saying that, we're pretty lucky. We've got a wide variety of species, really beautiful uh, snakes, lizards, turtles that we are able to keep. And uh, there's still a wide variety of species that we haven't even delved into. Uh, keeping yet, so there's plenty to keep us busy even here in Australia, but illegal to keep exotics. Um, just going back to the licenses, just in case anyone missed it before, what are the special licenses that people need to have to keep reptiles? Uh, so if you're keeping a reptile, um, mostly what you'll need is a basic reptile keeping license which will allow you to keep a really wide variety of species. If you want to get a little bit, bit more advanced, say you want to keep something like a lace monitor or potentially even venomous snakes or um, some of your smaller monitors that are a little bit more advanced, um, then you will need to move up in the license class. Um, but for the most part, most reptiles can be kept on that basic reptile keeper's license. And the list of reptiles that you're able to keep will vary from state to state. So it just depends on what state you're in as to what species that you can keep. So where can you find information about those licenses? Um, if you head online and you uh, basically go to your relevant authority, here in New South Wales, it's the Department of Environment and Heritage. Um, those are the group that uh, do all the reptile licensing. They'll have a complete list of uh, every single species that you're able to keep. And those lists uh, you know, go on for all the various states. So if you just head online and uh, you spend some time on Google, you'll be able to find that list of species that you're able to keep. So you mentioned before about um, having to feed mice and rats out to pythons. Are they alive or what, what's the special stipulations around that? No, certainly not alive. Um, and there's a few very good reasons for that. Big one is that it's illegal to feed a live vertebrate um, to an animal 
uh, in Australia. So you can feed it an invertebrate, um, which is a cricket or a locust or a cockroach. We'll typically feed our lizards live insects, but when it comes to rodents or rats and mice, or even uh, you know something like a rabbit potentially for a large python, um, those are gonna be what we call frozen thawed. So they're um, humanely euthanized, they're kept typically in a freezer, and then you would thaw it and feed it to your, uh, your snake. It's also really good because um, that way, that prey item does not have the opportunity to injure your snake. Out in the wild, if you look at a lot of wild snakes, they're covered in scars, they've got these big gnarly wounds, most likely from interactions with live prey animals. They feed on live food in the wild, which may potentially bite back. So by uh, providing pre-killed prey in captivity, you are avoiding that scenario completely and keeping your snake safe, as well as doing it in the correct manner. Talking about biting, can your reptile pets bite you? Oh, they certainly can. Uh, it's obviously gonna depend on the temperament of your reptile and also primarily what age it is. Um, if you've had a long-term captive reptile like this blue tongue here that's lived its life in captivity, um, then it's typically very relaxed around you, it doesn't feel threatened and it's not gonna try and bite. If you have a very young reptile that's straight out of the egg or straight out of mum, it may be quite vulnerable, of course, it's very, very tiny and it may try and bite. Um, but in saying that, as I mentioned, once it's been in captivity a while, gets used to the whole process, um, even used to handling in most species, um, they're going to calm right down and be really quite enjoyable and uh, not a threat whatsoever. Do you have advice for the best reptile to start with? Uh, probably this one in my hand, to be honest. Um, a blue tongue lizard, as I mentioned, very hardy. Um, they're quite a unique reptile, of course, as well and uh, as I mentioned as well, they feed on a wide variety of things. They are an ideal starter reptile, really good reptile to kind of uh, you know, dip your toes in the pool, so to speak, so they can be a good way into it. And then from here, you can go into any of your other various skinks. Maybe you want to keep shingleback skinks or some of your smaller desert species. Um, they're a great way into that, but they're also a great way to lead into um, some of your more uh, agile lizards, I guess, more active species like your bearded dragons. So by getting used to handling a blue tongue, um, then you're really easily able to uh, merge into a lot of other different species. So can you just go and get the reptiles from out of the wild? Pet shops, like where, where do you get them from? Uh, certainly not out of the wild. Reptile poaching, unfortunately, is a massive issue, uh, not just here in Australia, but right around the world. So you certainly do not want to be um, promoting that practice of removing reptiles from the wild. It's perhaps necessary in certain cases, but for reptiles as pets, you wanna be getting a captive bred reptile. So you can either get them from certain pet shops, they'll sell a select few reptiles that are available, but you really wanna be going to a, a breeder, a species specific breeder um, that has a lot of experience with that animal. They know the parents, they even know potentially the grandparents or the grandparents before that. Um, so they can provide you with a bunch of information on your reptile, you're gonna be getting it as a small juvenile typically, and that way you can go through the really enjoyable experience of raising it up and caring for it for its entire life, potentially. And last question, um, do you have any pets at home? Do you have any reptile pets? <laughs> I do. Um, I've kept a lot of reptiles over the years. In fact, this species here, the Eastern Blue Tongue, was the one that I started out with when I was about seven years old. I had a large male Blue Tongue called Bluey, very original. Uh, but right now, all I keep at home is a young pair of rough-scaled pythons, which are my favorite Australian python species. So I keep um, yeah, a young pair at home, and uh, they're beautiful snakes, but I'm sure down the track that a whole bunch more will creep into my house at some point. Uh, I do love keeping reptiles, but fortunately I get to keep a lot here at the park, so I don't have to keep quite as many at home to, to get my fix. All right, we're gonna wrap it up there, guys. I hope you learned a little bit about keeping reptiles at home. Perhaps we even uh, spurred you on to going on and getting that reptile license, getting your first reptile. Um, it's a fantastic hobby, we love it. That's how we all started, and we hope you enjoy it as well. Stay tuned, we've got a few more videos coming up, including tomorrow, and uh, we've got an exciting one for you tomorrow, actually. So stick around, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys, bye-bye.